So, are you hungry for a dinner party? Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast. I know you tune into this, whether you listen or you're watching um, on YouTube. Um, you tune in to find out about independent films worth discovering, ones that will challenge your senses, blow your mind, maybe freak you out or make you feel uncomfortable. And I would say that the dinner party definitely fits into that category. I'm pleased to bring on to the Film Threat Podcast, Miles Doliak, the director of the dinner party. Good to see you, Miles. Hi, Chris. It's good to see you. <laughs> so tell me, how did this project come about? This is not a, um, it's not the kind of traditional indie film that I would say see at a film festival, right? It's not a road trip per se. It's not a self-discovery. I mean, it's, and, and I will say that while you, you could more easily put it in the category of horror, I'd say it's, it's a little bit more, the, there are more layers than just being, just having horror elements. So how did this whole project come together? I appreciate you saying that very much. So the project was originally brought to Lindsay and myself, my producing partner, uh, by another of our lead producers, uh, Jim Boolean. Uh, there was a script uh, by Michael Donovan Horn, my co-writer. Uh, in those embryonic stages, I thought it had a lot of fascinating elements, uh, some interesting characters, this um, really... Um, interesting sort of uh, psychoanalytical idea that a lot of folks that are the hosts of this dinner party have been victimized in some way and they have compartmentalized that trauma and that experience and and turned around and become the abusers become the victimizers but um i felt like in those early stages though it had this sort of um engaging sort of rogues gallery vibe and 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 some interesting elements uh, that it needed a narrative through line. It needed some cohesion to tie the whole thing together. So Michael and I worked on the script together. We worked on it very hard. Uh, ultimately, the, the lightning in the proverbial bottle uh, was the character of Sadie, who uh, we uh, brought into the proceeding, and she became sort of the flame around which all the moths uh, revolve, um, which opened up new doors that we hadn't even initially imagined uh, for, for ideas that we could explore. And of course, uh, I, I had at the ready uh, my partner in life, crime and art, Lindsay Ann Williams, to step in and to play that role. Um, so that's sort of how it materialized. It was, uh, uh, it, it, it was uh, a, a really an interesting journey for me, especially because this was the first feature I've done where I didn't conceive of the idea, write the script sort of from beginning to end. This, this script came to me with a frame, with sort of a blueprint, uh, and then we built upon that foundation. Well, it's, it's interesting because I am a big fan of movies that all take place in one location because I think that that's a really difficult kind of in, uh, film to pull off, right? I mean, yeah. um, and this isn't my dinner with Andre, right? I mean, it's... <laughs> right. Although, although I love that, it, I mean, maybe in a way is kind of inspired by it, I, you know, I'm, but I love the, a, a film that takes place in one location with a small number of characters, uh, the drama, you know, I, I just think it's, it's um, those types of films I find really compelling. So, um, and, and in a way, like you could, I mean, this could have been a, a play, it could have been, you know. I, I do like those kind of those plays that take place in one location. It's very simple and things escalate and change. So in, in, you know, as a director, when you're approaching this going, okay, it's just, it's, I mean, it's, it actually, there are more lo locations than, you know, in the home, right. It's not just mm -hmm. the dinner, but, it, right. but, um, but what are some of the challenges in, in sustaining the drama with, um, effectively one major location for, for the entire film. Wow, well, they are myriad. I mean, I'm glad you said that because, you know, I come from the theater and I, uh, some of my greatest inspirations have been playwrights like Eugene O'Neill, Tennessee Williams, um, August Wilson, others. Uh, so I, I'm very pleased to hear you say that. Uh, but yes, the, the challenges are enormous. Um, I think it's said that 
the average uh, audience member, the average film viewer, uh, is exhausted by a single location that is a single room in about 90 seconds. That's sort of the, the limit of their attention span. So when you have uh, 25, 30, 40 pages, I don't know how many it was, uh, taking place effectively in this dining room, you really have to find ways to keep the material engaging and to keep the audience on the hook. And we did that in a number of ways, um, visually, uh, with the way we shot it. And it, every time we return to the dinner table, we have a slightly different approach from a camera perspective. That is, whether the camera's still or whether the camera is gliding along a dolly or whether the camera is starting to shake and float in a bit of a more cinema verite type style uh, in terms of the music, in terms of the repartee with the various characters batting the ball across the net. And, and, and that chemistry between the actors uh, and that symbiotic relationship between these, these, the people around that table, the seven people around that table was absolutely critical. And it's almost like there was this uh, kind of force field uh, of gelatin or something that we're, that we're all pushing against, you know, and, and um, thrusting and parrying. And I thought that uh, repartee uh, played out, it played out very well. Um, and that is a testament to the work of this cast, Bill Sage, Lindsay Ann Williams, Sawandi Wilson, Camille McEwen, uh, Mike Mayhall, my old buddy, and Allie Hart. Well, I want to ask you, um, there are, I would say that there are two types of, there are two types of ways that you play on people's uncomfortableness. And I would argue that w there, there's two. I mean, one, there's the the gore. I, I I mean, I think if you've seen the marketing materials for the dinner party, anticipate that there will be some gruesome things that occur, right? Okay. But I actually would argue that the more uncomfortable are the um, dramatic revelations. I, I I don't I don't I, I don't want to get into like exactly what some of these revelations are, but how did you play those two? Cause I actually found the drama to be more uncomfortable than the gore effects. I don't know. Maybe that says something about me, um, <laughs> but, but I really like to, to hear your take on that. Well, maybe it says something about both of us because for me, uh, psychological terror is far more horrifying uh, than physical or body horror or gore or whatever you want to call it. However you want to, characterize it. I'm much more interested in getting in people's heads and rattling around in the brain, uh, like, you know, that earworm, you know, like the, like that thing in Star Trek II, right, that, that Khan puts in their ears, the, 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 the thing that you just can't get out of your head, uh, that image, that story. Um, and I just think, you know, at the end of the day, one of my favorite films on the planet is Jaws. It's far more terrifying when you don't see the shark than when you do. Um, and that's really what we were going for here. We, we wanted to explore the depths in some respects, right, of the human id uh, unleashed and what it does, um, how it evolves and mutates sometimes to protect itself, sometimes to assert its dominance. Uh, and and uh, to, for, just for me, that's that's a great deal more compelling and interesting than you know, blood and guts and slasher, whatever. Uh, I mean, well, there's a bit of gore in the film, uh, and I hope that it is tasteful and appropriately uh, utilized. But that's that is not really where my primary interest lies as a filmmaker. Well, I, I'm glad you said that. You, you, you and I are definitely of the same mind. Um, psychological horror, I find to be far more. Uh, uh, it just it's something that like um, a gore effect. You can kind of get over it like once you're not looking at it. Right. But something, an idea, a, psycho, a psychological horror, um, one of the better examples is The Thing. I think the most terrifying yeah. scenes in John Carpenter's The Thing are the scenes where you don't know who is the thing who is no longer a human, right? 100%. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So, so I find those aspects actually more disturbing. Um, what was it like 
to work with these actors. You mentioned that you came from theater, and I, I think I think it shows in a good way taking that theater experience into um, effectively something that could have been put on as a play, but you make it very cinematic. I mean, the location is I don't know where you guys shot, but someone must have a friend who has a mansion because that's a pretty <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty um, I, I don't know it's, it's a great location. Uh, but how was it working with some of these actors? Because I imagine, especially when you're doing something that is um, one location, whatever, like those those gore effects to be consistent so that you've got continuity have to, I mean, I remember reading something uh, uh, Bruce Campbell talked about when they were making like Evil Dead 2. He, he just, after a while, he just got so frustrated. He just went to sleep wearing all the makeup and, and the, just so that they didn't have to apply it. So I wonder if you had to, in working with the gore effects, because one of the most terrifying scenes for a director to do is a dinner scene. You talk, when you talk to directors, it's like working with kids, working with, um, you know, animals and dinner scenes. Cause every, you got to make sure that, okay, the, the glass was here. The food was here. Or yeah. It was eaten up to this point that someone drank down to this level. I mean, keeping continuity straight is kind of, you know, it's got to be uh, a challenge, but then add add gore effects to that. Uh, how did you work with the actors on that? What, what what was that like? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a, it's a veritable nightmare, uh, if you will. Uh, but and it requires a very conscientious, uh, very meticulous, detail oriented art department. And we had a production designer in Julie Tosh and and members of her team like Georgia Robles, um, who were standing there with with the, the wine or the cranberry juice or whatever the hell it was uh, and making sure it was at the right level and, and all that kind of thing. My, you know, Lindsay, uh, producer, played Sadie, costume designer, uh, my partner in all things creative is, is such a critic when it comes to continuity. I mean, she just catches every little thing. And so I know if it's not right in the editing room, I'm gonna catch all manner of hell. So I pay very close attention, I try on set to pay very close attention to continuity. Um, but it also requires uh, a responsible cast. And I think we had that here. Um, uh, the, once again, returning to the, the folks around that table, Bill and Sawandi and Camille and Mike and Allie and, and Lindsay and myself, and we were all, we were, we just had a kind of energy and esprit de corps and commitment to the same ultimate goal and ideal uh, we we just we cared about what we were doing. We cared about each other. We were looking out for each other, kind of thing. It sounds trite, uh, but this cast had a real kind of familial intimacy about it. Um, and you know, the best script supervisor is an actor, because the actor knows better than anybody what his car or her character is doing in a given moment, and how many times he or she drank from that wine glass. Or whether, you know, he or she took his her glasses off on this line or that line, um, and we had actors who were really, uh, really meticulous in in uh, in helping us achieve some some measure uh, of of continuity uh, in in that regard. Uh, so, th but but you're right. I mean, that blood continuity is the absolute worst. I mean, it, that's four films in a row now where I've dealt with blood continuity and it's just, uh, it, it, it's, I don't think getting it perfect is actually possible, frankly. Well, you, you did a great job. I, I don't well, think I you. noticed any, any mistakes, nothing. Well, I, cause, cause all of that would just take you out of the film. So it's a good thing that you had a cast that was really on top of it. Um, what now, um, you're I, 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 first of all, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you the CEO of October coast? Is that uh, that's where no, the email no, came not. from? No, I'm okay. not. That, that's our publicist, Clint Morris. Oh, okay, good. Uh, okay, I love Clint. He he always introduced. He's always introducing me to the strangest films. I mean, I tend to like not like your traditional um, indie films, anyways. I mean, I, I like your traditional ones, but I'm just I like to have a wide variety of. Uh, I like to say I'm not a foodie at all, uh, which is odd talking about the dinner party. But when it comes to movies, I have very, I my taste is kind of all over the map. You mentioned some of the other films that you directed. Would you mind talking about them just for a, a little bit? Sure. Uh, so this is our fifth feature. Uh, uh, immediately prior to this one, we, we shot a film called Hallowed Ground, 
which was released last year. Uh, prior to that, uh, a film called Demons, which is sort of a uh, exorcism type um, psychological thriller. Um, uh, the Hollow, which is a Southern Gothic murder noir kind of film in the spirit of something like uh, the first season of True Detective or maybe with elements of No Country for Old Men, the Coen Brothers film. And then our very first film, The Historian, which is a chamber drama set in academia. I, I wrote it while I was in the process of completing my PhD uh, and, and wrote it based on some disturbing trends that I was seeing in higher education at that time, uh, which, which, by the way, contains a, just a towering performance, um, which Frank Scheck, uh, the, the critic, called a superb performance by uh, by William Sadler, the wonderful, wonderful William Sadler. And, and that film is actually being re-released on Tubi TV and I think Pluto TV and a, and, and a couple of other sites. It's back on Amazon now uh, with a new distributor. Um, so keep an eye out for that. But yeah, um, I've been very fortunate to work with some, some awesome actors and some awesome creators. Um, you know, folks like Sadler, folks like William Forsyth, Jeff Fahey, uh, Andrew Devoff, Stephen Brand, James Callis, Christian Seidel. I mean, the list goes on and on. Colin Cunningham. Um, and, uh, you know, I would absolutely love it if your viewers would uh, would go in and seek out and check out our other films. I feel like the dinner party is a bit of a culmination of sorts. It, it, it feels like a lot of threads coming together uh, to accomplish something that, that, that maybe is pretty special. Um, but a lot of blood, sweat, toil, and tears uh, went into those other films as well. So uh, thank you for asking about them. I appreciate that. Well, uh, we all know a lot of blood went into Dinner Party, uh, for sure, <laughs> having seen yeah. it. Um, yeah. uh, but, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I do like to ask, you know, when I have the opportunity to talk to um, uh, indie filmmakers like yourself, and I, I feel like the, the deck is already stacked against you because you're making an independent film. You know, uh, Hollywood films, studio films, I kind of feel like, or as I like to refer to it, factory filmmaking, mm -hmm. right, cookie cutter stuff. They can spend money and solve any problem, whether it's a special effect, whether it's, I mean, you know, they can de-age actors. Now they can do anything. I feel like there are particular challenges that indie filmmakers face that are unique. Just trying to use the tools you have and get the best possible work out of that. I, I want to ask you if you're a close friend of yours is about to go direct their first independent film, first time. Mm. What's the one piece of advice you would give that person, give that friend? I would say surround yourself with people you trust and with people from whom you are willing to accept criticism. Uh, because independent filmmakers simply cannot be dictators. Uh, there is no such thing as a singular vision, in my experience, in independent filmmaking. It is a collaborative sport. It requires everybody getting on the same page, everybody working for less than they're actually work that than they're less than they're actually worth I should say because they believe in what you're selling they believe in your vision they believe in the ideal they believe in the project um to, because you're absolutely right i mean you know studio films can afford to buy their way out of problems and obstacles independent films do not have such a, a luxury so it's about a bunch of people coming together, good, like-minded, creative folks coming together and coming up with creative solutions. It's the old, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And um, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of folks like that. Well, I'm glad you say that. I've always, you know, you know, being the director, you do get a, a lot of attention, but I, I've always believed that filmmaking especially at the independent level it's um it's a team sport you know it's totally a team sport and um uh you pulled it off uh, brilliantly with the dinner party um miles doliak thank you so much for talking to us uh, talking to us today on the film Threat podcast thank you it has been my pleasure sir thank you All for right. having me take care